Good morning and welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. My name's Tom Fress and I'm your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com and thanks everyone for tuning in. And I hope you find this book that we're currently reading, The Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador to this to the so-called Holy See, Francis Rooney, both interesting and educational, and I hope it stirs some Protestant sentiment in this country, some Protestant sentiment in this once Protestant land. The Vatican has far, far, far too much to say about American foreign and domestic policy, and not just America, but all the governments of the world. That is the new world order. It's simply the restoration of the old world order on a global scale, where the Pope rules over the kings of the earth, and they do his bidding in the world. And what is his bidding? To silence the Bible, to silence those who read it and believe in it, and to persecute the saints, and to create a counterfeit earthly kingdom that calls itself Christian, but it is diametrically opposed to the kingdom of Christ. It is led by Antichrist, the papacy. And that's why we, if we are wise, if we are wise, Bible-wise and history-wise, we will protest any more participation of the papacy with our government either our foreign or domestic policy. Now, we're talking about this initial first meeting between uh, U.S. Ambassador Francis Rooney and the papacy. We're currently reading in the front of the book the prologue, page 13, if you're following along in your own copy. We'll begin with the last full paragraph on the page. And uh, listen carefully as... uh, Uh, Francis Rooney uh, gives us some very, very interesting information. He says, speaking of this credentialing, this formal first meeting with the papacy, he says, this papal audience, more generally, the timing of my assignment to the Holy See came at an important moment in history for both the United States and the Catholic Church. America was four years out from 9-11 and locked in different wars and two difficult wars in two countries, including a conflict in Iraq, which the Holy See had strongly and vocally disapproved. Now, I'll stop and comment here. You must understand, and if you do understand, that the New World Order is simply the reestablishment of the old world order and that national sovereignties must first be dissolved in order to be compatible with a global government. Iraq was, for lack of a better term, recalcitrant. They did not wish to participate in in a global government. They wanted to maintain their own sovereignty. And that's what made Iraq the enemy of both the Vatican and the United States of America. The United States of America that uh, adopted the purpose to serve the papacy by bringing these recalcitrant nations into compliance with the New World Order. And it was... Regime change was in order for Iraq. They blamed 9-11 on Saddam Hussein, who had absolutely nothing to do with it. 9-11 was an inside job cooked up by the globalists in our own government, Roman Catholics almost to the, to the, to the man. And 9-11 became the inspiration for a holy Roman crusade against Iraq. Now, you won't hear that in the mainstream media, and you won't hear it in the inter- in, in the, uh, the alternative media. It's only those who are familiar with the scriptures and with history 
are able to see what's really going on beyond behind these wars. The Bible speaks of wars, wars, and rumors of wars, and we know why there are wars, wars, and rumors of wars, because it is through physical force, coercion, that the papacy assembles all the kings of the earth back under his authority. All right, we're just four years out from 9-11 and locked in difficult wars in two countries, says Rooney, including a conflict in Iraq of which the Holy See had strongly and vocally disapproved. Now, I want you to understand <clears throat> that that vocality and disapproval, strong and public disapproval of Pope John Paul II against the Bush administration for launching that crusade was simply for public consumption. Privately, the Holy See was backing that war. The Holy See helped instigate that war. The Holy See had everything to do with 9-11. The principles behind the, 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 uh, that event were Roman Catholic and Knights of Malta, almost to the man. Beginning with President Bush, who was a skull and bonesman, a secret society that is subservient to the, Je the Jesuit general. We had Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, a 33rd degree Freemason, and many argue also a Knight of Malta. We had Mayor Rudy Giuliani of New York City, a Knight of Malta. We had State Department Secretary Condoleezza Rice, a graduate of Roman Catholic Notre Dame, just like Rooney's children. You can go down the list. They were Roman Catholics. They belonged to Roman Catholic secret societies. And this new world order was their primary agenda. And all it took was a new Pearl Harbor to instigate a war to get control of the Middle East, where the Pope eventually wishes to present himself to the world as the representative of Christ, both to the Jew and to the Greek, the Gentile, and to all the other religions of the world. It's uh, the Antichrist. Now, understanding that the Vatican, or rather the Holy See's formal, strong, and vocal disapproval of 9-11 was simply for public consumption to maintain the innocence of the main precipitator of 9-11 and the subsequent wars. I'll continue. He says the Bush administration was making headway in bringing democracy freedom, and stability to Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan. But it was a difficult struggle on both fronts. Let me tell you why it was a difficult struggle. Those nations wished to remain sovereign and independent. Now, they fought valiantly against the Crusaders. They didn't want to be a part of this new world order. But the Bush administration, under the guise of bringing freedom and democracy to these, uh, these nations led by autocrats or monarchs, was simply also for public consumption. The real motivation, again, was to bring those nations in line with the New World Order, and it required regime change because those nations wouldn't negotiate with the New World Order. Secretly, the Vatican knew, the United States knew, the CIA knew that it was going to take war, coercion, hard power to bring those nations into line. You can call it religious persecution on a grand scale, on a nuclear-powered scale. If you understand 
that war from that perspective, the rest of hit, the current events in the world will help, will all, all of a sudden make more sense. Now, Rooney continues, he says, one of my tasks at the Vatican would be to explain our positions on Iraq and Afghanistan and to achieve a much, uh, uh, as much alignment as possible about the way forward. Our primary goal was to focus attention on those areas where the embassy and the State Department were confident that we could work with the Holy See productively. Now, obviously, or at least on its face, it doesn't appear that Rooney knows the real reason behind the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he's putting on a good face. But the Vatican, the United States, and the, and the military, uh, the militaries of uh, the powerful Protestant Western world went to war, went to war against uh, these nations. And they're all working together behind the scenes. Now, the Holy See had its own series of challenges and frustrations that autumn. The first of these, facing Pope Benedict XVI, was succeeding, <clears throat> rather, succeeding Pope John Paul II, one of the most beloved and extroverted pontiffs in modern history. The new Pope's academic background and his cerebral, seemingly introspective approach made the contrast especially apparent. Quote, he is, at, he is at heart a teacher, an academic, unquote, is how Thomas Rees, a Jesuit scholar and author of Inside the Vatican, described Pope Benedict to me. Quote, he is shy. He's a shy person running the biggest organization in the world, unquote. So Thomas Rees acknowledges that the Roman Catholic Church is the biggest organization in the world. It just doesn't elaborate on just how big it is. But the Roman Catholic Church is nigh on to 1,800 years old, and it is the leader of most of the secret societies. Okay? Most secret societies in the world especially Freemasonry, serve the Jesuit general. And they also serve in the highest positions in our government and, they, and the governments of all the other nations. That's how the Vatican, without taking the blame onto itself, achieves her goals through these cooperative secret societies and then remains apparently aloof and and unattached to the goings-on in the world. But this is how it becomes the biggest organization in the world. There are many organizations in this world that serve the papacy unbeknownst to the world. I named one, the principal one, uh, Freemasonry, serves the militia of the Pope called the Jesuit Order. Now, I could go on and on about this subject all day, and we'll get on to the book. But if you take those truths and add them to what has resulted from Vatican Council II and the ecumenical movement, <clears throat> now you see that, unbeknownst to them, the papacy now even controls the Protestants. Unbeknownst to them, the papacy now even controls the Protestants because he controls what they are taught in their churches. And what they are taught in their churches is futurism. The belief in a single Antichrist that comes just seven years before Christ's return, therefore exonerating the entire history of the Antichrist for 1,800 years. And single-handedly, destroying the Protestant Reformation, since the Protestant Reformation was built upon the foundational knowledge that the Pope, the papacy, and only the papacy could even qualify for the, prof the prophecies in the Bible 
concerning the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the Antichrist. So you can see now, because of futurism, the papacy is exonerated from the onus of Antichrist, and now he becomes the leader of the Christian world. And now is seen by Protestants who were once... Uh, vagabonds in the world because of the continual pursuance of the papacy against Bible-believing Christians, they now don't fear him. They are not concerned about him except to acknowledge him as the leader of the Christian world. And whenever these wars come about, no one questions whether or not the papacy is behind and instigating these wars, and for what purpose they are fought, and for whose benefit. So the papacy truly is, without going into any detail, this Jesuit priest acknowledges that the Roman Catholic Church is the biggest organization in the world, and it is. Now, Continuing, he says, Benedict had been pope for only six months when I arrived in Rome, but he was already enmeshed in several controversies. These included the ongoing scandal of priests charged with sexual abuse, which predates his papacy. Now, obviously, I need to comment here. He's glossing over a global pandemic. Roman Catholic priests have been abusing children for hundreds of years. As a matter of fact, some authoritative sources that I've read suggest that even in the earliest ecumenical councils of the Roman Catholic Church, predating the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholic Church had to go into executive private session after those councils to deal with the sexual perversions of the priests. Now, I, I could launch into another sermon about Romans chapter 1. I hope you're a, a frequent, if not uh, <clears throat> constant, listener to Inquisition Update. And you understand why there is an unholy, unnatural, sexual perversion in the Roman Catholic priesthood more than any other segment of world society. It's because of idolatry. Romans chapter 1 explains the divine curse that comes upon those who would fashion with their hands and then bow down and worship images and idols. God causes them to have another unholy affection. Read it in Romans chapter 1 and understand it. So this Roman Catholic priest pedophile pandemic is global, <clears throat> and particularly unrestrained in Roman Catholic countries. Central, South America. The United States, because of its press, made it public. But, after, but following in America's lead were the Roman Catholic countries of the world. Ireland, which is vastly Roman Catholic did a study and found that the Roman Catholic priesthood, who, which ran the school system in Ireland, had nearly a hundred years of history of abusing children. And the controversy was so loud and mainstream in Ireland that the Vatican was forced to retrieve its nuncio. That's a Roman Catholic country. Germany, historically Roman Catholic, also was publishing in the mainstream media stories of a pandemic of pedophile priests in Germany. Italy, France, Spain, all of them. Not just America. Everywhere the Roman Catholic Church presides, everywhere there are Roman Catholic priests, there are suffering children. Because the priests of the Roman Catholic Church suffer the divine, the divine consequence of idolatry, the divine recompense of idolatry. 
it's a permanent ailment among the priests. It's an historical ailment among the priests. They are sodomites because they are idolaters. Okay, anyone who would reduce God to a man-made thing, a filthy man-made thing, is bound to defile his own body in like fashion. That's the message of Romans chapter 1. Read it for yourself. Now, Rooney is only going to gloss over, briefly mention, this global priest-pedophile pandemic. But it's my job here at Inquisition Update to tell you the whole truth about this scourge for which God is coming to judge. We make a grievous error when we follow the mainstream media example and refer to sodomy as homosexuality. I want you to listen very carefully. The word homosexuality should be completely erased from your vocabulary. Because when we use the word homosexuality to describe this plague, we disconnect that abhorrent behavior from the judgment of God, the previous judgment of God upon that very sin in Sodom and Gomorrah. By using the term homosexuality, we leave the world in ignorance about God's previous judgment on sodomy and also about his judgment against the sodomy that literally defines the Roman Catholic Church, that church, that government that seeks to govern the whole world. So take the word homosexuality out of your vocabulary. It's not homosexuality. It's not it's not a disease, it's a divine recompense, one which God has already judged in Sodom and Gomorrah. The unholy relationship between female and female and male and male is sodomy. It has already been judged, and the ruins of Sodom still remain today for tourists to examine. And so, let that be a lesson. It should be a lesson to the Roman Catholic Church. Well, the lesson, the real lesson for the Roman Catholic Church is to answer the question, why are our priests sodomites? The same reason the sodomites of Sodom were sodomites. They were idolaters. They fashioned with their own sin-sick hands images and idols and then bowed down and worshipped them. They suffered the divine consequence, the divine retribution for that grievous error. And those of like uh, perversion, the Roman Catholic priests, also suffer that same divine retribution. Wherever you find idolatry, you will find sodomy. And everywhere you find sodomy, you will find idolatry. They go hand in hand. It's a cause and effect relationship. And this author, being devoutly Roman Catholic and a U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, is going to mention the priest-pedophile problem, but he's not going to explain it because he doesn't understand it, because he hasn't read his Bible We'll be back right after this. And uh, we're dealing with some pretty heavy information out of this book this morning, but I can't just pass over it and allow Francis Rooney to give his watered-down version uh, of, of the consequences uh, and, the, and the, uh, the widespread nature, the global nature of this priest-pedophile this sodomy scourge that uh, has afflicted the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Rooney chooses to gloss over it. I choose to explain it as fully as I comprehend it 
to let you know the magnitude of it. <clears throat> there's just there's just no calculation of how many children have been sodomized by these priests. Only God knows the suffering that these priests have unleashed against innocent boys and the consequences that they'll suffer in their lives because of it. We shouldn't gloss over anything such like this. Neither should Francis Rooney. He says, Benedict had been Pope for only six months when I arrived in Rome, but he is already enmeshed in several controversies. These included the ongoing scandal of priests charged with sexual abuse, which predates his papacy. Now, Rooney is attempting to shift the blame of this pedophile priest pandemic, this sodomy scourge among the priesthood, and pass it off on a previous pope. But listen, listen, this has been the responsibility of every pope throughout history. It's been a constant scourge in the Roman Catholic Church. And Pope Benedict XVI, during the reign of Pope uh, John Paul II, was the prefect for the preservation of the doctrine of the faith, the holy office of the Inquisition. He was quote-unquote, God's Rottweiler. He was second in command to Pope John Paul II, and it was his particular responsibility to govern the priests. The Holy Office of the Inquisition, as it's called by the Roman Catholic Church, now called the, the Congregation for the Preservation of the Doctrine of the Faith, it was his duty, it was his duty to deal with, with the sodomy scourge among the priesthood. And to make it appear that this scandal took place during another pope's reign is dishonest on its face. Primarily responsible for that pandemic that only became public during the the, the reign of Pope John Paul II belongs squarely in the lap of Benedict XVI. And it was Benedict XVI who ordered that if any child came forward with allegations, that those allegations had to be made in the secrecy of the church. Could not be made public. Otherwise, they would suffer uh, sanction from the church. It was a violation of canon law for a sodomized altar boy to go public with his abuse. They were granted, these, these allegations were granted what was called the pontifical secret. And anybody who brought charges against a priest of that sort became the object of of the retribution of the church. And even Roman Catholic priests, uh, one of which, his name is Tom, and I'm, his last name escapes me at the moment, but he said so as much. And he led an investigation on behalf of the children against the Holy See. Tom Doyle, Tom Doyle was his name. And uh, even members of the Roman Catholic Church knew the real trouble that was being suffered by these children among these sodomite priests. But it wasn't just American priests that were committing these, these atrocities. It was global. Now, he continues... He says the American church, now in, in this he means the, the American Roman Catholic Church, and I've, I've pointed out many times here on Inquisition Update, that because the United States was uh, founded at a time when it was fresh in everyone's mind 
the persecution of the papacy against Bible-believing Christians and the bad name that was brought to the Roman Catholic Church as a result of the Protestant Reformation. American Roman Catholics had to remain somewhat aloof from the Roman hierarchy of the church. Because of the circumstances led about by the Protestant Reformation and the unpopularity of the papacy at the time, the colonists were in no mood to hear of any rumor that the papacy or anybody from Rome was in control of Catholics in this country. And so the American Roman Catholic Church rose up distinct from the rest of Catholicism. It had to deal with a Protestant, a, a, a vast majority Protestant population. It had to take an underground position in this country. Roman Catholicism was not free to practice in the colonial period. And the only way they survived was that they played their cards well and kept Rome out of their business and essentially told the papacy, if we are going to survive in this new land, we have to remain separate from Rome, and we have to create our own church. So, unique in all the world is the American Roman Catholic Church, and that is what Francis Rooney is speaking about here. He says the American Church had been especially affected by allegations and lawsuits, prompting, quote, the greatest crisis in history, unquote, as the theologian George Weigel noted. Okay, according to this theologian Weigel and according to Francis Rooney, the greatest crisis ever to strike the American Roman Catholic Church was the pedophile priest pandemic that, really became public first here in the United States. Now, before becoming Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger, in his role as the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, put in place several important new measures to streamline procedures for assessing abuse allegations, all right, to ensure that they were dealt with promptly, hardy har har, and to engage the civil authorities in a timely manner. Okay? What does all that mean? He didn't streamline anything except to streamline the secrecy of these allegations and to protect the priests, and more than that, to protect the financial assets of the Roman Catholic Church. First of all, to keep these allegations private within the Roman Catholic Church structure and never to go public, and then to make the victims the victims of the investigations and to exonerate the priests and to prevent, prevent them from being uh, put into the civil legal system in this country and prosecuted for their enormous crimes and imprisoned, the Vatican said they are my priests, I'm responsible for them, the papacy represents a divine law that precedes civil law, and it's up to me to take care of my pedophile priests. And that's what they did. And because of public pressure, some of those allegations became public, and they were handled by the civil authorities against the wishes of the Roman Catholic Church, and particularly against the wishes of Cardinal Ratzinger. And so, let the truth be known. Now it says... These were important steps, but the church remained under incessant attack from those who believed it had been negligent. It wasn't negligent. It was instigating it. It's an organized, sodomite society, the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. It has been for nearly its entire history. 
Now, beyond the impact of the scandals, the church was suffering a decline in active participation in much of the Western world. Of approximately 65 million American Roman Catholics, for example, less than 30% regularly attend Mass at the start of 2005, and that number was dropping by the year. Could it be that secularism isn't so much robbing participation in the Mass, or is it the scourge of sodomy among the priesthood that has made Roman Catholics well, sickened by their own religion. I'll let uh, God be the judge. It says, a similar wave of secularism was emptying churches across the traditionally Catholic countries of Europe. 76% of France's citizens still professed to be Catholic in 2005, but just 12% attended Mass regularly. Ireland remained 90% Roman Catholic, at least nominally, nominally, but regular church attendance, once uniform, had fallen to 50%. So even Ireland, Roman Catholic Ireland, 90% Roman Catholic, were receiving only 50% attendance at church. The situation was even more troubling in Italy. 97% of Italians identified themselves as Catholic, but just 30% regularly attended Mass. Spain and Germany, the Pope's homeland, were trending in the same precipitous direction. The dangers undermining families, religions, and governments in these increasingly secular societies would become a major emphasis of Pope Benedict's personal diplomacy. Trying to hold his uh, his church together when his parishioners would rather walk away. Good advice. Walk away and keep walking. Keep walking toward Jesus. He's your salvation, not the Roman Catholic Church. That ought to be evident to any and all Roman Catholics. Continuing, he says, whatever challenges and changes are faced, uh, each faced, the United States and the Holy See remain two of the most significant institutions in world history. One, a beacon of democracy and progress, speaking of the United States, and the other, a sanctum of faith and alliance to timeless principles. Timeless principles. You know what the principles of the Roman Catholic Church is according to the Bible? The timeless principles preserved by the Roman Catholic Church go all the way back to Babylon. That's why she's called Babylon the Great in the Scriptures. Long predating what we know today as Christianity. That's why Roman Catholicism can in no way legitimately be described as Christianity, but anti-Christianity. And the, t- the degree to the, that the once Protestant churches have now repudiated the Protestant Reformation and have sought to ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, they too have become mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And only repentance will save them from their Romeward march. Now he says, despite the obvious differences between the first modern democracy and the longest surviving Western monarchy, both were founded on the idea that, quote-unquote, human persons possess inalienable natural rights granted by God. This had been a revolutionary concept when the Roman Catholic Church embraced it 2,000 years ago and was equally revolutionary when the Declaration of Independence stated it 1,800 years later. Now, Francis Rooney only gets by with this statement because of the universal ignorance of Christians today about the history of the Roman Catholic Church 
regarding human rights. Remember that it was the Roman Catholic Church who butchered untold millions of Christians. It was the Roman Catholic Church who crucified Christians. It was the Roman Catholic Church that burned Christians to the stake. It was the Roman Catholic Church who sent crusade after crusade after crusade against Bible-believing Waldenses holed up in the Alps, trying to remain aloof from the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth and remain faithful to the Scriptures and to Christ. It was the Roman Catholic Church who led the persecutions against the Jews. It was the Roman Catholic Church that led the persecutions against the Protestants. And it was the memory of all of these things that made the Protestants of the American colonies forbid the practice of Roman Catholicism. Would to God that the Christians of this nation would return to like sentiments. But instead, they've forgotten it. They've not been taught it. And once more, most Christians are happy not to know about it. And ignorance in this case is not bliss. The Roman Catholic Church, and particularly not the papacy, can claim any accolades regarding human rights. If there is one abuser of human rights, above all others, it is the Roman Catholic Church and the global priest pedophile pandemic. The sodomy among the priests is only part of the problem. But devout Roman Catholic and U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, has to gloss over all that information and tout his pope and his church as being the leader in human rights. And the world, the gullible and ignorant world, buys it. Well, I don't buy it here at Inquisition Update. We don't buy it here at First Amendment Radio either. The greatest abuser of human rights in world history is the Roman Catholic Church. Inquisitions. 605 consecutive years under the leadership of 83 consecutive popes made a literal science out of persecuting, torturing, and killing God's people. They even went so far as to make an industry out of building the machines of torture used by the Inquisition. They resorted to drawings of those machines so detailed and exact in their dimension and the description of their building as to be equivalent with any architectural or mechanical draft drawings today. Those who are most expert at torturing human beings are familiar with the history and the intricacy of the industry called persecution and torture at the Vatican. She's the author of human torture. And who did she torture? Anybody who would not bend the knee to the Pope and reserve Christ and him only as their king, who rejected Roman Catholic canon law in favor of God's holy law. And those are still the ones today who lie the most threat from the Roman Catholic Church and from this Roman Catholic government, the United States of America. He says, given our mutual respect for human rights, it is natural, even inevitable, that we should be friends and collaborators, speaking of the United States and the papacy. Do you think the United States is really all that concerned about human rights? Are you losing your human rights? Do you know that my speech today 
which was mainstream during the early 1800s. Protestant pastors speaking out against Rome from border to border and from coast to coast in this country, warning the American people what would happen to them if they ever lost their Protestant faith and turned their eyes away from the papacy that the Pope would eventually rule this government and then once again persecute Bible-believing Christians. Do you think our government really cares about the human rights of American citizens? Or does it care about the human rights as determined by the papacy, the world's greatest persecutor of the saints? As time goes on, I hope America's people begin to realize we are losing our rights because Rome has no respect for human rights and Rome controls our government. One of these days we'll be imprisoned for speaking out like I'm speaking out today on Inquisition Update. And I believe the day is closer than I even think. The truth is going to be outlawed in this country. Already ignorance prevails. But if Protestantism begins to raise its head and begins to oppose and protest the Antichrist of the Bible once again and seeks to liberate God's people from papal tyranny, our government will act on on the Pope's behalf to bring us into subjection just like they bring the rest of the nations of the world into subjection to this new world order. This program is called Inquisition Update for a very, very good reason. The future doesn't bode well for Bible-believing Christians who protest the Antichrist and his new world order. He says, given our mutual respect for human rights... It is natural, even inevitable, that we should be friends and collaborators. Why it took nearly 200 years for us to establish formal diplomatic relations is a question explored at some length in these pages. The answer lies in our respective histories, particularly in the evolution of one's attitude toward the other. The short answer is that both the United States and the Holy See had to overcome deeply held convictions and perceptions, entrenched anti-Catholicism on the part of Americans, anti-democratic monarchical reflexes on the part of the Holy See, and that neither managed to do so until the latter half of the 20th century. What's he talking about? First, he acknowledges anti-Catholic sentiment in this country. When did that take place? During the revolutionary period, the colonial period. Protestants fled to this country to get away from papal tyranny. They did not want Roman Catholicism and papal tyranny to follow them to the new land. That's why 99% of American colonial citizens at that time were Protestant. And only a a, 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 a tiny minority holed up in the colony called Maryland were Roman Catholic. And they were so sequestered that they even had to ask the Pope to butt out of their business and let them assemble an American Roman Catholic Church separate from Rome. Otherwise, they would be destroyed by an overwhelmingly Protestant, Protestant colonies. And why did the Vatican hate our new society? Because it wasn't monarchical. You see, the Pope picked all the monarchs of the world. And if government rested in the hands of the people, he couldn't impose his monarch upon us. There's more to this, much more to this, but I've run out of time, and we'll continue Monday on the program. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Please pray for me as I continue to tell the truth on First Amendment Radio. I'll see you Monday. 